Peter and Matt, can I take you on a Dexter ride for a minute? Because I spent a lot of my life on Dexter and I'm obsessed with it. Michael, how many times have you been approached for a Dexter revival and why was this time different? I mean, I've been approached unofficially many times in the streets <laughs> by people who have ideas. Um, but as far as, I mean, I think there have been probably before this three legitimate sort of ideas or concepts about what we might do and none of them just felt right. This one, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with how much time has passed. You know, I mean, this is going to happen in in real time, as if as much time has passed as has passed since the finale happened. And um, yeah, I mean, we just kind of got the creative band back together. Clyde Phillips um, is back, who was the showrunner for the first four seasons, um, running the show. And Marco Siego is one of our great directors. Is sort of we're going to shoot it like a long 10 hour movie and um but um yeah it was just i don't know it was a combination of obviously the scripts and the timing and it just it just uh i i always thought that maybe the time would reveal itself when it made sense to do it and it did and um i'm excited i was just uh visiting the sets uh just the other day and it's real it's really yeah. happening what were your feelings on the series finale of Dexter and, and the response to it? I, I mean, I thought it was completely, um, from a storytelling standpoint, like from a character standpoint, it made sense to me what he did, but I certainly can appreciate why it, why it left um, the majority of viewers feeling a little um, left out in the cold or gypped or uh, frustrated because I mean he literally didn't say anything at the end he'd been talking to us the whole time and he just stared at the camera and it was over and he put his sister in the ocean and what the hell was that so you know in a way the reboot is you know the the, the appetite for the reboot is is in a way facilitated by the fact that it was a less than sort of um, satisfying ending for people so um yeah, I mean, I I want to I, I want to find out what the hell happened to the guy just as much as everybody else. Yeah, it's it's like a weird blessing in disguise, right? Because if it was this like perfect finale, everyone would be like, I don't want this show to come back. Why would you yeah. do this? Yeah. And it's yeah. Like, oh, like everyone's like, yes, the show's coming back. We're getting more Dexter. We're finding out what happened. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> What's one thing that you would personally like to see addressed in the the revival? Um. I I don't know if they're going to go for it, but I'm angling for him to be running his own pizza restaurant. <laughs> Just because, you know, I mean, I don't need to explain exactly. why that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of loath to, to say anything because I don't want to give anything away. Um, right. You already know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting you out of your misery Cause darling you're dragging me down Let's take it all the way from the top. You guys met on Broadway, which you normally don't hear about when it comes to starting bands. So uh, take me through the whole thing. How did the we should start a band combo come about? Yeah, Hedwig on Broadway and then Hedwig national tour. I did it with Peter and we were touring all over the country, eating a lot of tacos, you know, visiting bathrooms all over the place. And we were like, we got to just, you know, keep playing music together and make our own music, um, not not pre-written music. And we got back, we jammed. We, it was all instrumental stuff. Um, and then um, I believe, Peter, you played it for Mike at some point? Yeah, Mike heard it and noticed we didn't have any vocals and offered to come in and sing. And then I think the next day he came by with his notepad and wrote, wrote some lyrics on the spot. And the first princess song was born and we just kept doing it. What's the story behind the name Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum? Um, there have been numerous ones uh, that I've heard, but we went to this party uptown. This was pre-COVID, 
back when we had just started to make music together. And we, I mean, the only thing that explains it in hindsight, we didn't confirm it, but I think we all got uh, something slipped in our drink, a uh, hallucinogen. And we kind of freaked out and left the party together or we walking down Central Park West. And we got to around the Natural History Museum and Matt was like, you guys look on the steps. You see what I see. And we all kind of collectively saw this little princess walking up the steps, opening the door and these butterflies flew out. I mean, we saw it in our mind and it coincided with the time we were trying to come up with a name and um, it kind of just this was like a eureka moment. Wow. So it was, uh, yeah, that's how it happened. <laughs> So you guys were really in it, like right up until lockdown, you were performing and filming videos. What has it been like having this kind of unintentional hiatus from touring? You know, for all bands, it's it's a drag for sure. Um, but it, you know, it forced us into finding new ways to create. And, and uh, I think we all agree mm -hmm. being in this band was a great uh, sort of life raft this year, just being able to share ideas. Sometimes we do it in our studio here in Union Square or or just sending each other tracks. And, you know, we just sort of got creative and stayed, stayed engaged with each other. And so not being able to play live was sort of gave us this other opportunity to just keep making music. Your EP came out in 2020. You know, we put it out in last April, right when the pandemic hit. Yeah, yeah the timing was maybe a little less than ideal, but but hopefully um, people will will revisit it when the full length is released in February and just it'll sort of just be a, a, a deluxe part of the record release. Are you, you're planning on touring as soon as you can? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Whenever that is, yeah. We were gonna go out and play at um, Happy and Harriet's actually. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and that was supposed to be in, I think April or something. Yeah. Obviously didn't happen. But yeah, we were going to record some tunes out there at Rancho and play some tunes. Hopefully that'll still happen someday. Who do you think are your biggest influences in the music world or even beyond the music world that you feel like are present in this album? Bowie is definitely an influence. Uh, I mean, I'm among so many. I obviously second that. Um, Blondie, who I've toured with for the last I don't know, 12 or 13 years. They're an influence um, and the way they mix, you know, keyboards and make them rock and electronics and pioneering that has sort of rubbed off on me, I would say. And I'll do a combo of like uh, some Black Sabbath meets Giorgio Moroder. Well, so I feel like people are still kind of discovering your band and you guys have fans from all different backgrounds all over, like Peter, Morningwood, Wallflowers, Matt, we have Blondie, Michael, Dexter, Six Feet Under. What's the number one thing that people ask you or say to you after a show? Mostly they ask if we do bar mitzvahs, to which the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. And yeah. when are you playing again? And when are you going to release music, which is always a good sign. I mean, unless they're like, I want to get that record and break it over my banister. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. And 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 it's exciting that, you know, we, we, we started playing well before we were releasing anything. So like the only way to hear whatever we were up to was to um, come to a show. So I'm glad that we're going to be able to you know, give some people some music that they can listen to without coming to see us because they can't come to see us. 